Now let's see what happens if we apply the two derivation operators one after the other. Depending on which operator we start with, we obtain two double prime operators. One maps object subsets to object subsets, and the other does the same with attribute subsets. Let's prove some statements about the first one. Of course, similar statements can be proved about the second one. First, the double prime operator is monotonic. If A is a subset of C, A double prime is going to be a subset of C double prime. Why? Let A be a subset of C and take any object G from A double prime. We want to show that G belongs to C double prime. Then, since this holds for an arbitrary object from A double prime, we'll conclude that A double prime is a subset of C double prime. By definition of the derivation operator, G has all attributes from A prime. But A prime is the set of all attributes shared by all objects from A. So this is the same as saying that if an attribute is shared by all objects from A, then G has it. Since A is a subset of C, every attribute M shared by all objects from C is shared by all objects from A, and therefore G has every such M. In other words, G has all attributes from C prime, and thus belongs to C double prime, which is what we wanted to prove. The second property is extensivity. An application of double prime to set A only adds attributes to A. So A is always a subset of A double prime. Well, let's take an arbitrary object G from A and show that it belongs to A double prime. A prime must be a subset of G prime because A prime is the set of attributes shared by all objects from A and G is among these objects. So these shared attributes are among the attributes of G. This also follows from the first property of the derivation operators we've proved earlier. A prime being a subset of G prime is the same as G having all attributes from A prime. And this is the same as G being a member of A double prime, which completes the proof. The double prime operator is also idempotent. It immediately takes a set to a fixed point, so that no further application of the operator can change anything. Applying double prime to A double prime gives A double prime as the result. A double prime is a subset of A double prime double prime by extensivity, which we've just proved. So it remains to prove that A double prime double prime is a subset of A double prime. Then the two sets are equal. Let's take some object G from A double prime double prime. It has all attributes from A triple prime. But then it has all attributes from A prime because A prime is a subset of A prime double prime, which is the same as A triple prime. We know this since the second double prime operator, the one that maps attribute subsets to attribute subsets, is extensive by a similar reasoning that we used to prove the extensivity of the first double prime operator. And then G is in A double prime, which proves the property. Every operator that maps subsets of some universal set S to subsets of S and has these three properties is called a closure operator. So we have two closure operators here. One acts on object subsets and the other on attribute subsets. We say that a set A is closed if A equals A double prime. This terminology is used for both object and attribute subsets. Let's look at some closure operators not related to formal contexts. Let's fix some set S 
and look at the set of all pairs of its elements. Any subset of such pairs is a binary relation on S. We can define a closure operator phi mapping binary relations to binary relations as follows. If R is a binary relation, let phi R be the smallest transitive relation containing R, which always exists and is unique. So, if R contains pairs x, y, and y, z, phi R must contain a pair x, z. This is necessary for it to be transitive. Here is an example. We have three pairs in R, but we have to add the fourth one, 3, 2, to make the relation transitive, because R contains pairs 3, 4, and 4, 2. So, why phi is a closure operator? First of all, it is monotonic. Suppose that R1 is a subset of R2, and take a pair AB from phi R1. For monotonicity to hold, we need it to belong to phi R2. Two cases are possible. If AB is in R1, it is also in R2 since R1 is a subset of R2. But then it is also in phi R2, because phi never removes any pair from the relation to which it is applied. If AB is not in R1, but is in phi R1, then R1 must contain a chain of pairs starting from AX1 for some X1 and ending with XNB for some XN, such that the second element of each pair in the chain is the first element of the next pair in the chain. If there is such a chain, any transitive relation containing R1 must include the pair AB. But if there is no such a chain, AB is not necessary to enforce transitivity. So, if there is such a chain, it must also belong to R2. And then, for phi R2 to be transitive, it must contain AB. The second property of closure operators, extensivity, is satisfied by phi because of how we define it. It only adds pairs to R, but never removes any. What about its importance? By definition of phi, phi phi R is the smallest transitive relation containing phi R. But phi r is already transitive, and so phi phi r is the same as phi r. Another example of a closure operator, this time on trees. More precisely, it maps a set x of vertices of a tree to the smallest vertex set of a subtree containing x. For example, if x is the set consisting of the two blue nodes, phi x must also include two additional light blue nodes. Try to prove that this operator is correctly defined, that is, for every x there is always a unique smallest subtree containing x, and then prove that it is indeed a closure operator.